We are recording. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Um, this is the ACE, ACE meeting of um, May 18. Um, yeah, we just page down. So if you if you've never read the note well, please. Um, Take some time to, to read those. I mean, this meeting is going to be under the not well, the regular ITF not wells. And we have a small agenda. So um, I'm wondering who is volunteering to be a Java scribe or minute taker. Anyone volunteering? I will be. You have not. I will be doing at least some of the minute taking. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Um, if you haven't signed the blue sheet, please sign the blue sheet. The link is on the um, on the chat room here. And um, so we basically have uh, two main items, uh, which is a. Uh, Sorry, uh, I can't see a link in the chat. You cannot see it? Nope. Thank you. There it came. Okay. came. It's another trick. <laughs> yeah, it's probably only. You can only see it if you were already connected yeah. when it was. This is because you're using WebEx instead of Miteco. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so documents that are in AD review, uh, and then we will focus on the group king documents, and if time permits, we will go through the other documents. So documents in AD, I think that's the DTLS. The DTLS document and the OS core document. So, who, is that uh, Ludwig or Francesca that goes with DTLS? Uh, Francesca, I'm only support act. The DTLS is not me, it's Olaf, uh, I no, guess. Oh, yeah, Olaf, sorry, sorry. Francesca is Oscar. Olaf Oscar, yes. is the main, main person for the DTLS or main contact. Yeah, so do you want me to posted. say something about that? Yeah. Basically, we have addressed the latest comments from Ben and uploaded the version 10, which includes all of the comments except for the topic that has been raised by Francesca and one of the comments where Ben included some additional references explicitly a, a, a talk from ITF 104, I think, in, in the SAC working group, which I have to um, follow up um, to, to see whether or not we have to write something in there. But everything else has been addressed by us. OK, thank you. So ben, do you have something to say? or? Uh, no, just that I, I see that the updates came in, so I still have to take a look at them. So I could hardly hear you. Maybe it's only me. Uh, but I suppose everything is fine. No, audio has been very clipped. OK. Um, I guess I will try to change my audio settings to use a different microphone. I think I got his comments. Okay.
Okay, so should we move to the, the next topic? Yeah, I think we can. Okay, so Francesca? Yes, I cannot see my slides. I don't know if oh. you're Where sharing. Where do you see or... them? Yeah. I don't see anything. Oh, you I don't, don't see, see your screen. Okay, so I'm gonna reshare. So I'm stop sharing. Were sharing something? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't Here. appear on my screen either. So Could, we we Could you stop the camera as well? Do I have my camera active? Thank you. So do you see nice. something here? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. So okay, so this is and also I can hear myself, so could you mute, please? Thank you. That's better. So um, this is, uh, as most of you have probably seen in the mailing list, uh, the update of Access Rise thread. Um, the link is here in the first slide. Next slide. But first, before talking about that, I wanted to give um, uh, a short uh, summary of what's the status of the OSCOR profile document right now. So, yes, Daniel, if you could go back to uh, the slides and slide number two. Thank you. Um, so right now we have submitted version 10, which answered uh, ben, Ben's review. And um, we also have a pull request, which is version 11. It's not, uh, not submitted yet, but aims at answering OCF comments and address Ben's re-review. So includes includes also the Ben's uh, pull request. And uh, also there were two leftover GitHub issues from Jim, which we dug into. And um, what is still missing, so we, um, we think that once this pull request will be merged and version submitted, version 11, uh, then it will only be seen two points in the OSCOR profile. Uh, one is the text explaining why we recommend a 64 bits nonsense. I don't know if Jim has any update on that. Um, oh, he doesn't. Okay, um, and the second point is the update of access rights, which we're going to talk about today. So next slide. Also, Ben, if you have any points that you think is not uh, addressed of uh, all the the very thorough review, please let me know. But I think everything should be addressed, and there is only one comment in the last pull request, which you have. Um, which relates to the update of access rights. So I think it should be answered once we decide on this point today. Right. I think my notes just say that we are waiting for the text from Jim about the 64 bit nonces. Right. That's, yeah, that's the two points left. Exactly. Yeah. So how does it work now? Right now, the OSCOR profile defines the update of access rights as described in this picture. Um, so a client gets a token, token one from the AS, and posts it to the resource server. Um, and this token, together with the nonces, um, is used to derive the security context. And this security context is used to protect uh, requests and responses with those core. And whenever the client wants to do an update of its own access rights, then sends the um, post token to the AS, gets a second token, and then um, uh, the, pro the procedure is the same. So another security context is derived, a different security context, um, um, which is linked to the second token. And the first token and the first security context are removed. So this is how it works right now. Next slide. 
uh, yeah, this is if you want to read the details, you have it in the slides of uh, all these exchanges. Next slide. So uh, we have a proposal, which uh, I tried to formulate in the email, which is to mandate at the access token to update uh, the access rights must be sent over the secure channel. So we propose that this is done both in OSCORN and the DTLS profile. Um, Jim uh, assumed that uh, that was already the case for the DTLS profile. I have looked at the DTLS profile, but um, it was not explicitly said so. So if it is the case, uh, it would be good to have it explicitly written. Possibly it might be good to have it in the framework as well. I don't know. And uh, second, Sub proposal is to separate the uh, endpoints where uh, the client posts at the resource server to post a token and, and do an update of an existing token. And the reason for that is that it would simplify uh, a lot processing and implementations. And um, so any message that is uh, sent unprotected to the update endpoint would be rejected if we implement the proposal above. And um, in the example of the OSCOR profile, any message that will be sent to the authorization info endpoint will always result in a new security association. So the resource server would not have to do any type of um, looking up, do I have this uh, do I have a security association with this client? Is there a token associated with this? Is this an update or is this a new security association with this client? Next slide. So this is what the proposal would look like. It's much simpler. The security context is derived the first time that a token is received from the client. And then once the um, uh, token two is retrieved, from the authorization server that is posted over the secure channel. In the case of OSCORE, protected with OSCORE. Uh, in the case of the TLS, over the TLS channel. And then um, no need to rederive security context. Next slide. This is the detail of what I just said. And next slide. Um, yes, so I sent this. Uh, in the mailing list, and I got a couple of um, responses. I, I've, I've seen some responses today, which are not included in the slides because these were already posted. Um, but Ludwig uh, uh, seemed to say that, yes, that it should be sent over secure channel and that it's not necessary to separate the two endpoints. Uh, Ricardo and Marco as a OSCORE profile uh, implementers have said that, yes, uh, that uh, one is doable even without the point 1.2, 1 point B. And Michael has had some consideration about access rights um, um, of the token and the updated token. Um, and then Ben made note about the possibility of collision of key ID, so to talk about key. And yes, in fact, we should talk about security associations and not key identifiers. Um, yes, so any opinion? And of course, please bring up the emails that were from today, which I haven't had the chance to summarize. Um, you're on here. I, I just had a question about the last point from Ben there. Um, why is there a problem with collisions of key IDs if this is the, this is a, we assume there is a, a given authorization server associated to this token and this channel is associated to this, the secure channel is associated to the token, which in turn is associated to an authorization server, and and the authorization server should not um, should have unique key identifiers. Is there really a problem here? I mean, in formulation, we could talk about key because that's the thing we need to verify. But is is there really a, even the case of collisions?
Ben, are you mute? Lauren, part of that would be you would only have the security association if you did one B. If you just did one, it could be posted non secure. Okay. Yes, this is sort of assuming that we're doing one B. Right. And I think I was also remembering in some of the previous document a review, I had to be educated about how the key ID is not necessarily globally unique and it is potentially scoped based on who is receiving the value. Um, or maybe it was who was sending uh, still pretty early for me in the morning. Uh, so I just wanted to, to make sure that there was no risk of uh, issues in case of collisions. Because even the same AS can issue a duplicate key ID for the same key or for a different key if it's going to be used in a different context. You know, you might want the key ID to be very short, uh, scoped on, say, which RS is going to be handling it or, or which client. Okay, so, yes, given that what you're saying is exactly that, that if we're using key ID, we get a token with a certain key ID, we need to still verify this token comes from the AS with the key. And then we know that this, I mean, given that we, we, it's, um, we have received the right, the token associated to the right key, then we can, yeah, okay. I think it makes sense to bring that in as well. Yeah, thank you. But I, I like to hear um, objections to either one or one B. Should I reiterate my yes, please. objections? Yes, please. yes. So I find one B to be needlessly complicated. I mean, what are you doing? You're submitting a token. Okay, it's an update, but that's just some internal processing. And you're creating a whole new endpoint with a lot of logic behind that. Okay. Where we could just use the existing endpoint to submit the token. Because that's on, on the REST level, that's the only thing that you're doing. You're sending in a new token. Yes. And then so internally, actually... internally, that it's an update of a token or that it's just a completely new token, that is something that you can process internally. Okay, so I can um, re uh, um, go go over that. So the reason why this would simplify is that um, what you say make, makes sense for, uh, for example, for the DTLS profile. But in case of the Oscar profile, um, so we first reach the endpoint and and then we we do the OSCOR processing and so a resource can or it should be should be defined to be protected or unprotected so we need to know if this resource is protected or unprotected um before we know what processing we're going to do in this resource and please like OSCOR implementers can um correct me if i'm wrong but i thought that because uh, in the case of the update of access rights, if we mandate that, that this endpoint must be must be um, accessed via a protected uh, request, but we only know if you're doing an update later on. And with OSCOR, you're already done the OSCOR verification. Um, uh, you you have already verified the OSCOR message. You're already past the OSCOR layer before you know is this protected or unprotected. So the point is that, okay, so you can have some processing saying, uh, this is an update of access rights, so you should verify OSCOR, but how do you go back to the layer, to the OSCOR layer and say, okay, now do the OSCOR processing? I don't know if I'm clear. Um, 
not really, but yeah. So, so, so you're not following. Okay, let me try again. So, um, the authorization info endpoint is usually unprotected, and there is some processing that is defined where once you receive that request with the token, you verify the token, and then you generate uh, the nonces, et cetera, and you derive the security context. In case you are now mandated, mandating that if this is an update of an access token, this, uh, this request must be sent protected, the post, post authorization info. This means that you first have to check that this is an update of access rights. So you have to check that this contains token that um, um, that is related. Like you have to check that this client is doing an update of access rights in some way. And then once you know that that is an update of access rights, you have to make sure that this was actually sent protected. So you have to kind of go back in the stack, in the processing stack. This is uh, Rikard Hoagland there. I've been working on the implementation of OS Core in Java. And uh, at least in the Java version, after you have processed a message, you can understand if it was sent via co op or if it was, in fact, OS Core protected at the resource. You can check that information. So going back in that sense is not very difficult. Mm. And that's, that's, yes. And I reported that feedback and that but this is why i said that it would be simpler because if you have two resources you can just say this resource must be access protected and if i receive any message that is unprotected i will reject it and this other resource can be accessed unprotected i don't care um so jim for example in your implementation if you receive a message and there is a different o score processing based on the content of the message, can you do that? Can you first process the message and then in case reject the message if it wasn't protected? Well, I'm going to have to to process the message on an OSCOR layer before it can get to the resource because it's encrypted. Exactly. And, exactly. And and that information is always, always carried up to the resource because otherwise the resource okay. can't do access rights in general. So, so what you're saying is that uh, you you process the OSCOR layer, and then you you process the uh, the actual I don't know like co uh, co op uh, ACE layer, and at that point you might um, at that point you can see if that request was an update or an actual post token for the first time. Yes. And but. At that point, do you know, can you retrieve the information, this was OSCOR protected? And if it wasn't, can you respond with a, a 401 uh, error message if it was supposed to be and it isn't? OK, so that to me seemed very complicated because that is what OSCOR does automatically to reject uh, uh, a message like to reject a request that is supposed to be protected and is not protected, OSCOR does that, right? So I thought if you have two separate endpoints. I always do that at the resource, not at the OSCOR layer, because the OSCOR layer doesn't know anything about resources for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's not a problem for your implementation either. I just I I was just assuming that, um, yeah. It, maybe you can see why to me that sounded complicated because that uh, I assume that the score layer was more separated from the co-op, and if a request was to be rejected, it would be rejected at, at the score layer. But in this case, basically, if you receive a request um, um, without OSCOR. So what would happen is that, for example, you receive a request with an OSCOR option, and this is supposed to be um, a post token for the first time, you should accept unprotected request. So you should even possibly discard that OSCOR option because you don't you're not you don't want it to be protected. 
if you don't discard that Oscor option, you will verify and you will reject because it failed. And this is a very simple way of uh, uh, denying updates. So a client could could um, try to post, uh, sorry, to to deny not updates of access right to deny just post token. If a client is trying to post a token and the middle man adds an OSCOR option uh, with garbage in the option, and this goes through OSCOR processing and it fails because it's garbage. It's actually, yeah. So I, I think one benefit with, with the proposal is that you can have a clear, um, clear communication on when you want to renew the security context and when you want to reuse it. Yeah. Um, and the, the idea was that that should simplify processing because you can just split those two. You don't have to think about it, kind of. But if, but if this is not a problem from an implementation point of view, then I, I think what I, is it, a, is it a way forward that we, we have this as an example of how you could implement um, an update resource. I, I don't think that I don't think that we can have it as an example. Either we either we specify this endpoint in in the framework and then we we use it in the profiles, or or we don't. I, I, I don't think uh, the profiles can have examples of additional resources. So okay, so then it, it boils down to the to whether there is a problem with using uh, the same resource protected and unprotected, as as can be done in DTLS or OSCore. Is that a problem or not? Not a problem for me. I do that all the time because I may return different answers depending on whether you are protected or unprotected. Mm -hmm. Okay. So from both implementers of a score, which I thought was the because DTLS is different. The actual URL is different because you have a DTLS scheme. Um, so your access, you're actually reaching a different endpoint. Um, but for Oscor is the same endpoint. Um, but if, if both uh, implementers say that this is not a problem, then uh, I think we can skip one point B. And uh, I think I only got positive feedback about one, the, 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 the proposal about posting the update on uh, always on a protected channel. So, um, my question was, should this be in the framework? I'm starting to think that maybe it should. Uh, Francesca, well, there is one advantage to, to at least using the update type concept, which is you're not doing that second security key derivation. Yes, that's uh, if you go down a couple of slides, Daniel. Um, that that's the point that you will not do that sec second security context derivation. Um, what I was trying to suggest is that the resource server should detect that this is an update based on, oh, it's done over this secure channel which is associated to this token and you're doing a post of a different token. So you're trying to um, do an update. And at that point, instead of sending back the nonce, it should update the access rights. So the proposal is to do exactly as in this picture, although the bold face authorization info slash update should, should only be authorization info. So that, that's why I say that it's complicated for OSCOR because you're doing a different processing. Um, what what before the the RS processing was very simple. I get this token, I respond with the nonce, and then I derive the new security context. This is now 
not happening if you reach this endpoint over a secure channel. The logic in the in the resource to see if this was overall score or not, and then parsing the token if it's a token update yes. or not. But you still have the yes. pieces of information in the actual resource, so you know if it was file score or not, and you know the content of the token. So you can have your logic yes. in and the resource. Also, for example, the payload needs to be formatted differently. In one case, you're only expecting the token to. In the other case, you're expecting both the token and the don'ts. Yeah, that, but I think that could be parsed in the resource. You can have like an if statement if this was overall score and or not, and then depending on if it was or depending on certain content of the token, you would process it differently. Yeah, if that information, this res this uh, request was done over all score um, is passed on, then I think it should be fine. It's more complicated but it should be fine. I, I, I personally would have preferred the simpler option, but uh, it's not strictly necessary, apparently, so. Also, we disagree on your definition of simple. Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's I mean, it's, it's, simpler, it's simpler for the implementation, I think, I believe. Yeah, so but document-wise, it requires quite a lot of sure. changes. Mm -hmm. That's true. And the document is already a 80 plus pages document the framework. And I have heard reviewers complain about how complicated it is to read that. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that just because I feel it's complicated. No, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm bringing this forward now because uh, it came up now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But I understand that it's uh, it's you, uh, yeah. not the <laughs> optimal. <laughs> yeah. And um, okay, so, Francesca, so, do you think we have made a decision on how we're going forward with this? So I had a question for you, Jim. Did you don't didn't see the problem either that you have two different payload formats depending on uh whether it's uh, an update or oh no that's that's no problem at all okay fair enough so so i i guess the only question that i have left is is this general enough that there should be a statement in the framework saying that updates of access rights must be made over a secure channel with the resource server I think this is a small enough addition to the framework that um, it doesn't require. And I. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ludwig doesn't like me anymore. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that the framework, I mean, if you look in the way back machine, what we wrote when we started ACE, it's, it's embarrassing when we were planning to have the framework ready. And now, like in the 12th hour, we're deciding to add more changes to the framework. I'm not comfortable with that. I think this is not necessarily anything that needs to be in the framework. After all, it's slightly different procedures for DTLS and for OSCORE. You, you mentioned. DTLS have a different scheme, and OSCORE has different. But the the high payload. level is the same. The high level concept is the same, and that's why I think that it does belong in the framework. Then we can not have it in the framework, uh, and and we can specify in each profile separately that this uh, update of access rights rights must be done over a secure channel. But it feels more of a patching uh, things that should be specified in the framework, um, meaning that if there is a new profile coming up, it will have the choice 
to say, no, I don't, I will not do update of access rights over secure channel because that is not specified in the framework. Um, so, so there is the, the general concept of update of access rights done over the secure channel. And then there is implementing it in the profiles, which we can do. And I think we will do unless I, I hear any objection. Um, but it's, I mean, it seems logical that we will do it in the profiles anyway. It's just, does this need to be in the framework as well? And I, I definitely see Ludwig's point. <laughs> this is coming last minute like this, but again, this is when I, um, when I saw this, so. Then again, the framework isn't really finished yet. I mean, there is a number of reviews to come. This might be your last call comment for the for the framework, Francesca. I, Joran, what do you mean the framework isn't really finished? I, I mean that there, it's it, it's leaving the working group, right? But there is a number of review steps, in, including last call. I thought we were in last call. Ben, I, I, can I, you, I can like, you like, those, um, set those. us right there? Uh, you still have the IETF wide last call. Okay. Yeah. And then you have any comments that come from the area directors. Hmm. As from the IESG. So there's two more sets of reviews <clears throat> that still need to be processed. I think the framework has been through the ITF last call. Yeah, that was my impression. <laughs> no, no, you haven't run any of them, any of them that far, that you, because we're running all of them at the same point in time. Uh, no, I think I think I did run this one through. Possibly that was an error, but it's gotten uh, several last call reviews. Oh, wow, now I'm really confused. <laughs> Which one's the framework? Auth. Uh... Um, it says it's waiting for write-up external party. Right, and the waiting for write-up means it's waiting for the IESG ballot to be created. Oh, OK. So it has gone to last call. Yeah. The okay. three page makes it a little bit more clear. Okay, so strike that option then. I mean, the, I, I just, I independently of the ITF um, um, status of the document, I did want to bring this up at this point because it's not yet published and because I thought this is, uh, it, it would be good to have it in there. So, if we can get it in there, I would be happy. Then if we if we don't, at least I brought it up. And um, I don't think it's a big enough change that it would require a lot of effort to put in or, or no, review. No, no. Uh, sorry, it's not the effort to put in. It's the question. No, no, but also review. Redo? Do we have to exactly. redo the whole ITF last call project? For, uh, process then. And my that thought is what has is, me really worried. <laughs> right. And my thought is no, because I don't think this is that big that it would require to, to redo all of that. And if can we should, we, I'm probably can like, we not. Can hear the area director's opinion on that as well? I'm, I'm fine with your opinion, Francesca, but I would like to be that to be confirmed. <laughs> because if it's if it's just me putting in the work to write it, that's not my problem. I can do that. But if it's then waiting for the next tell chats, having questions in the tell chats, answering those questions, then we're speaking uh, another three months before the document moves on. And that is really what I want to avoid. Yeah, I think it's it's not crystal clear to me whether this change would need another ITF last call. 
Um, <laughs> like it, it sort of depends on what the actual text change would look like. And of course, you know, want to write the text if we don't know that it's going to be worth the time to put it in. Um, I, I do kind of agree in some sense with Francesca that having the separate endpoint is like a clear separation at sort of a philosophical level. But I think that what we've heard from the implementers makes it pretty clear that at a, um, at a technical level, we don't actually need the separate endpoint in order to make the processing happen. And so I'm, I'm kind of inclined to agree with Ludwig that we don't need to make the change in the framework. Uh, I was also just now trying to do a quick check uh, and we don't seem to talk about update of access rights very much in the framework at all, um, which would also to me suggest that we don't need to go into great detail on how you would do so in the framework. So just to clarify, this, what uh, I was talking about now was, it, it seemed to me that, uh, I mean, the chairs can call the consensus, but what I've heard is that um, uh, the, there is pretty much consensus about not doing a different endpoint. So the change that I was talking about that would be small, in my opinion, uh, was only about uh, um, saying that update, update of access rights must be done over a secure channel. That is the, the whole the whole uh, part about, um, yeah, uh, what yes, I'd like good to point. Sorry, I, the I had gotten myself a little confused again. Um, no, no. So, <laughs> yeah, and then I guess the other thing that occurred to me is that with the given uh, profile, we don't necessarily know that there will be the option of using uh, the same endpoint over a secure channel and, and not. Um, so I, just, I think the whole having the framework not be overly restrictive means, uh, or having, having, not having the framework say that you must do the update over a secure channel leaves more flexibility for future profiles that may or may not have issues doing that. Well, right now the framework doesn't say how you have to do your update of access rights. The only thing it says, if I'm not misremembering, is that you should only have one access token associated to a proof of possession key. Right. I, I think that's, I, I also think that's Which restricts the update of access rights somewhat, I, I will admit. It does restrict I it somewhat. But go ahead. I think at this point, I don't want to put it in the framework, um, at least in part because the OAuth working group is playing with some total changes about how you request tokens with additional rights. And until they get through with that, I don't really want to think restrict ourselves on anything. Um, Mike, what is unclear to me is suppose we don't change. What would be the problem of having a separate document that's handled so with there that. is there is no problem um what i i would say like this this came from analyzing the profile oscar profile noticing oh there is something missing and then thinking about it and realizing okay maybe this is also missing from the dtls profile and if it is missing from both profiles is it something that should be higher level mandated rather than at the profile level, at the framework level. But if we don't do it at the framework level, I'm also happy to have it in the profile 
I just wanted to bring it up because I do think that it's more general than that. But yeah, I, it's not. I, I just think it would be better, but um, but also I understand that the framework is very much long, and we don't want to delay another thirty years or so. <laughs> Let's not exaggerate, but. Uh... <laughs> No, the other thing is that um, I think it's good to have um, a framework quite um, minimal um, so that it works on every profile. So that's um, um, maybe it's also better that it's being handled by profiles that actually need it. Um, but I have no strong I, I opinion on that. that. I mean, I think that all profiles will need to specify something about update of access rights. I don't know. If that is not the case, then... Uh, yeah, I don't know why we're doing it. <laughs> if, we, if profiles are, can just skip it. May I uh, clarify the update word here in update of access rights? You When you say... Um, when you do token two, is it because token one has expired or it still has valid access rights and with token two you're adding additional access rights? I think this is similar to what Michael Richardson in his mail was, uh, uh, his reply to, to my email was talking about. But no, token one is not expired in this case and token two has a different set of access rights. It can be a, a superset or it can be a, a disjoint set. We don't talk about that at all. Um, but the idea is that token two is going to replace token one. But it does so, replace it. So all the it, it access rights. It replaces it. Okay. So all the access rights that came with token one is revoked, and then token two is basically taking over. Yes. So when, I, when you say update, I always think of it as an additional or mm -hmm. um, type of thing. Um, I, I thought this was part of the framework. Um, but if it's not, maybe we need to clarify that. I, I feel um, so you coming completely through a different uh, type of protocol. MQTT re-authenticates um, with a token during a session so uh, and and that session is secure so we don't have the additional security requirement and then if anything is submitted to offset info we assume we treat it as a new token and um validate it basically so um i think we don't differentiate between the first access to the offset info versus the second access to the offset info so are you saying that you don't uh, okay. Treat it as a new token. So you, you, you. I understand that you try to differentiate it because you do not want to do the security context derivation again, which I assume is costly. That's why you want to avoid it. It's also because the framework specifies that uh, the client can only have one um, token at the resource server with that key. Suggests, not specifies, not requires. Suggests. Recommend. 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 Yeah. Recommend. Okay. The, the capital letter okay. word. If a new token submitted the old set info and a valid token already exists for the client, it will be just rewriting that. And um, in the next connection, uh, validation of the token will happen. So um, from a framework perspective, I think our profile does not need specification from the framework that this needs to happen in a secure channel. But this is, I know that uh, MQT kind of very different than the rest. But, so but I'm, you're saying because it's already, because you're, you're saying that the channel is already secured. Or? Yeah, you don't need to the generate a new, you don't the session. need to redo the DTLS handshake or, or the, the TLS handshake for MQTT. Yeah. So, so I think, already... sorry, go ahead. 
Yeah, that's exactly why. So re-authentication happens during an existing session, which is TLS protected. And that's why a new token is, um, when submitted, is already secured. Well, yeah. already secured but meaning is sent over a secure channel. So what, what I was, yes, and I think that the TTLS profile also does this post-token, uh, post-authorization info um, over a secure channel. And what I was suggesting is that the framework mandates that the post authorization info is done over a secure channel. So what you're, if I understand correctly, you're saying we already. No, uh, no, no, no. The framework doesn't mandate that. No, and that's the proposal that I was oh. saying that we should add. But so, so basically, you're saying that the, the MQTT profile already uh, comply with that. Yeah. If we were to add that, MQTT would already comply and. Yes. Uh, during the yeah, so it would already comply comply with that. And then what I'm tr I'm trying to say is that if the session disconnects and the client now wants to submit a new token to Odset Info, it goes through the um, uh, uh, and it it just submits it as a new token. It doesn't try to tell the RS as as a continuation of my previous token. This is not the first time I'm connecting you. It doesn't communicate that. We haven't thought about that option, and I don't see why it would be necessary to communicate to the RS that is the second time I'm connecting to you. No, and that's actually, that's possible to do in OSCORE as well. Like you can, client can post a different token, token three, as a, as a new token and do so over an unsecured channel and the resource server will be unable to tell that this is the same client that posted token one. Um, so yeah, it sounds like to me it sounds like it's very much parallel to yeah. what yeah. But this is great. Thank you. Good to know that it works. Okay, if, if we're done on that point, another related question is on how we how the resource server knows this is the latest token if that's necessary i i well, well so uh, if it's yeah. if it's posted over a secure channel then the that is uh responsible for um you could post an old token over a secure channel yeah yes so you could if, like as a as a malicious token holder, you could say, oh, this new token gives me less access rights. I'm just going to post the old token again to overwrite the new one. I don't know how realistic that case is, but... <laughs> well, I don't see a problem with that, as long yeah, as the that's... token is still valid. Yeah. That's not a problem. True, it should be. That's the way it should be. Uh, but Jim, you raised an interesting... Sorry. Point. Sorry, Ludwig, can I just spin up on that? Yeah. So, so what we are saying is that we don't, we don't, re, re, the old token does not revoke the previous tokens. So, so all the rights issued at one point, they are, re, remain valid until expiry. Just confirming that, Jim. That was certainly my understanding. Is that the AS is responsible for any tokens that issued until they expired, and we should have no way to guarantee uh, that just issuing a new token would somehow revoke the old one. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we should try and follow how they do it in OAuth in that way, and that's basically my understanding as how OAuth handles that. I mean, there is token revocation in OAuths, but it's a newer add-on. Sorry, then the final question for me is, it's um, this point about identifying, or the RS point of view, identifying that this is an update in the sense that this, is, this access token is related to this other access token. So we had several ideas there. There was one key identifier, 
and also verifying the key. And Jim brought up the an identifier explicitly in the Zebra Web Token. Do we have any way forward on on those options? If we go for the uh, proposal, which is uh, either like okay, if we say that the post authorization info must be done over a secure channel, that you don't need to have uh, identifiers to identify the token because that secure channel is associated with the token. I'm done. Thank you. So um, I'm not sure it's it's very clear how we proceed forward. Do do we want to bring that discussion on the mailing list, or um, do we want to think a little bit? Uh... I think I did bring it to the mailing list, and we got a lot of responses. Uh, so I think it's up to you, Chair and AD, I guess, to. Tell us how to proceed. Yeah, so, yeah, in that case, we may sync um, with Jim and um, Dan. Um, so you don't think there is anything additional that should be brought? No, I think with the discussion we had today and what was said in the mailing list, I think it was pretty clear. Okay. Um. Okay, so we will sync with uh, Jim and Ben and um, then let you know. Okay, thank you. So, um, next presentation. So, we can close that topic, I guess, now. Yes. Yes. That was it. Okay. So, um, key group come? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, That's probably this one. This one. Uh, no. No, it's not this one. Ace key group come should, should be named. Oh, it's not. Not the slides. Is that the group? Let me check. This one should that be. One, yes. No? Yes. Yes. Oh. That's the one. Okay. Next slide. So an update of uh, where we are. This is the quick recap. If you've never seen this before, next slide. We're not gonna go over this slide. Uh, what's left? Yes, so this slide is taken from last interim and um, version 06 has been posted as you might have seen. And um, I haven't seen any objection to it from Jim. So. I assume that the um, issues were resolved in a way that is satisfactory. So today I was hoping we could discuss a couple of open points from old mailing list uh, posts. And then there is a couple of open points from previous reviews that were never answered. And then there is also some open points from Peter's review which uh, I haven't reported because it's mostly editorials. So once we discuss the points from today and we decide how to move forward with this, we plan to submit the version seven. So since ITF 107 version six was submitted May 11th based on Jim's review and there was some discussion at the ITF 107 virtual, then the PR was merged and all issues were closed. Next slide, please. So I, I spent some time to reorganize the to-do list. So this is what our to-do list looks like. So the highlighted yellow um, are the ones that we will be dis discussing or that are left. And then there is a lot that has been done, but uh, we actually never had the chance to answer. 
uh, males. So we actually included all the points and I made sure that we did, but uh, we have a lot of, for example, uh, gym reviews of version five and uh, three and two um, have not been <laughs> answered in the main list. But this is just to say that, yes, we have answered them um, in the document. We actually probably uh, should answer them. Uh, we can do that. Uh, but at this point, some of these reviews are so old that I don't know, Jim, if you want us to spend time to actually answer that email. Um, no, you don't need to do that. Okay, thank you. Great. So I, I can actually um, send you a Google Doc link where we keep all these um, reviews and make sure that everything is answered. So if you want to check, you can see there, but they are included. Next slide. And what about Ludwig? <laughs> it's done. <laughs> and, and <laughs> Ludwig review of version 02 has been done and answered in the main list. So this is why it's yep. only done. The plus to answer meant that... I plus have to no meant... objections to how okay. my review was <laughs> answered. So. Great. Okay. For once I agree with you, Francesca. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? We always agree, don't we? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Yes, so let's start with the most uh, recent, I believe, uh, mail. So this is uh, uh, some points left from Jim's review uh, of draft version number four. Uh, I added links so it's easier to see where I'm taking this from. Uh, so this first point, open point is should we try and harmonize the scope format here with either the format M in MQTT or with the one that Kasten once proposed? The multi multiplicity of scope formats is going to become a problem at some point. <laughs> yeah, I like the proposal that Karsten made, the AIF. Okay. So just to remind you, the ace key group com just but, leaves it. But we shouldn't make it mandatory because then the OAuth uh, group will be all over us because they explicitly have not defined any scope format. Should make it like a suggestion that you can can specify that you follow or not. Because I can so, see the endless discussions otherwise. So in the ASCII group one right now, we don't specify the format of, uh, I mean, we specify scope um, as a CBOR uh, containing roles and topic or group identifier, but we don't say what these roles and group identifier um, are supposed to look like. So it's it's uh, different from what I don't really know what Karsten's proposal was. The AIF. Yeah. It's a uh, it's a Seabor encoding for uh, for restful uh, commands. Is Karsten online? No. Okay. <clears throat> And the, the problem that I have is basically merely one of every time a new format comes in, the AS has to be modified to be able to parse that format. So the less often that happens, the better. So does it mean that you recommend not to have the recommendation even? I would like to see a recommendation for GroupCom to say, we suggest that you use this profile, that this format, but don't require it. Just basically what okay. Ludwig said. Okay, and and MQTT, the format in MQTT and AIF are different. So we should probably go for one. 
Right. Choose one of them. I don't care. Okay. Um, sure. I don't. And the see question is, which that. one? Um. Yes. Which one? <laughs> Mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Carsten, your your draft is expired, right? Or published. I regularly resubmit that about once a year. Okay. So I don't know if it's active right now or not. Uh, yes. No. Sorry, it's not expired. It's active. Um, so does that mean, okay, so that will become informational reference if we take it as um, example of scope or um, One question I, I would have is, um, I have the impression that MQTT format has a lot of um, um, we have a lot of experience on that, and it's pretty widely deployed. So, um, if we take a new one, is that um, how much experience we have with that new one, and um, how much we know it's solving a problem? Wait, 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 wait. MQTT is widely deployed, but not the scope. I wouldn't. Okay. Uh, even yeah, though, even though I'm, I'm, I am, I am proposer of the scope. I wouldn't be offended if Francesca doesn't choose it. Okay. Scope format is one thing that we with to be able to um, differentiate between the actions, the resources, uh, the action. Uh, the resources that the actions are um, done on, basically. That's why we basically uh, created that format um, and recommended the use of it. So if there is a stronger scoping format, I would be happy to look into that as well, if it applies to us. So I'm, I'm completely uninformed because I did this work in 2014 and I haven't really followed it. Where is the NQTT proposal documented? The MQTT document. MQTT profile. Okay. I look it up. Yes, if this could uh, um, align, that would be perfect. So we know what to recommend in this. It's pretty clear that, that the proposal I'm making is not going to cover all the restful situations either because it, it, it assumes that. At the time the authorization is uh, being made, you have names for all the resources uh, th that you are interested in. And if, if those resources are dynamically created uh, and, and destroyed, uh, then it, it's probably better to have a format that is very application specific and that, that is able to categorize these resources uh, based on some application considerations. So I'm, I'm not sure that, that uh, at least in, in the rest world, you can do much better than, than I did in 2014, uh, but then sometimes you have to, and uh, then you have to do something application-specific. So being open to an application-specific way to do this is probably very important. That said, uh, Karsten, I still think we need a starting point somewhere for people who are just, and I, 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 what I was suggesting is let's point them towards AIF as a starting point. And then if the text is clear, like you can use this, but if your application, blah, 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 then define your own, then I think we're, we're good. Oh, I'm I'm stupid again. Can, can you point me to the section in the MQTT draft? Sorry about that. Let me find it. I'll put it in the chat. Thanks. OK. 
Okay, but I think that I have a point forward here. Um, um, yeah, I, mean, I don't see any problem with adding uh, informational reference. I mean, if we recommend it, the AIF, uh, should it be normative or is it okay if it's informational? In which case we can just say this is an example, I guess. Informational is fine with me. Okay. Good. I'll do that then. Thank you. So next point. To, to become a working group document at some point in time. Please ask. Kick it off. Please ask. Hello. Okay. Um, so the next point is how does one enforce the must not for, sorry, uh, it's always in the same slide. Sorry, it's the same. How does one enforce the must not for the resource name of ACE group? And the must not that this is referring to is um, in the, uh, when the interface is defined, it, uh, the ACE group resource is defined as follows. This resource is fixed and indicates that this specification is used. Other applications that run on KDC, uh, on a KDC implementing this specification must not use the same resource. Um, I don't know how, how this can be enforced, but I think that this needs to be here or I think I may have missed this before. We're, we're saying that there's a resource name of, at the top level of ACE group and we want to claim ownership over that. So we, we say that the, the root URL path ACE group given here is a default name. Implementation are not required to use these names and can define their own. But we're also saying that if, if we implement this, this um, this resource um, can only be used for this specification. So yes. we, we're not, we are doing a bit like what the ACE framework does with the um, uh, token endpoint and authorization info endpoint. So these are default names. I'm just wondering how this is going to uh, relate to the BCP 190 issues where the um, the URL namespace belongs to the uh, operator of the server and not the protocol specifier, which I mean, given that we say the implementations are not required to use these, uh, there's not an obvious problem, but I just mm. want to make sure that we think about it earlier yeah. rather than having uh, somebody put a discuss bullet on an ISG evaluation. Yeah. And and we did uh, have some comments about that, which is why we explicitly stated this, that these are default names. All but right, given thanks. the name, once the name is fixed, uh, other application must not use the same um, resource for something else. That was the the mass knot that Jim didn't like, but I don't really know how to say the same thing in a different way. In a testable way. Right, the testable is the key part. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that if somebody else tries to use it, things will break. Um, but I do not know how to, how to test for it uh, in the code. Right. So I don't know if I had. So I don't know. That, yeah. Go ahead, Jack. That that was my issue too. Was I don't know how to test it, and I don't know that it actually needs to be stated that you can't use it. I'm perfectly willing to say if you do use it, is things going to break? But we should be telling people what that resource name is if it's not 
the default anyway. Okay, so okay, so you're suggesting that we remove this as not, and instead we say if uh, if other application use this name, things will break. And then what was the second part that you're saying about default names? That that path is going to have to be put in the resource directory for people to find it if it's not the default. Aha. Uh -huh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Definitely, we can add something about that. Oh, you don't need to add that. I mean, that's that's a given. It's just people are not going to use that default name if they know they're supposed to go someplace else. Mm -hmm. Right. I thought that was already, uh, yeah, defined in the previous sentence. That works for me. Okay, uh, we can go to the next point. Um, Yes, uh, I'm not sure, but I think that I might want to suggest putting a node in the path between group ID and the node ID for a single endpoint. This allows for one to not deal with potential name collisions with the other nodes under group ID. Um, we never ended up doing this, and it's still valid, I believe. Um, I don't know if we it actually helps to have nodes there. What? So basically, the GID part um, takes the value of the group identifier, so it's different for different groups, and the node part takes the value of the node identifier, so it's different for different nodes in the same group. But not having that uh, text string nodes between group ID and node, I'm not sure that that helps. Because if you have collisions, uh, you would have collisions anyway if you have nodes, right? No, you would not. Because the name of the node under nodes can be anything. Whereas if the name, you, you cannot, for example, assign a node ID of, I don't know, you know slash public, you know, public keys. I don't remember what, what uh -huh, the okay. other node names are under GID. Uh -huh, okay, okay, okay. So you collisions with, not with the other nodes. Okay. Mm. With the other endpoints yes. under GID. Okay, now I understand. Yeah, that makes sense. We will do that. It makes it a bit longer, but I guess it's fine. <clears throat> okay. <Make> an <laughs> an. Sure. <laughs> that works. Okay, next point. Should a client be able to ask for a previous set of key material? Consider the case of a client having key material N, missing update N plus one, and getting update N plus two. The client then gets a message encrypted to update N plus one. He never saw the material and thus cannot decrypt the message. Um, that sounds very complicated. Um, if if a node missed the uh, key material for decrypted messages, isn't that the same as just missing those messages, like those messages getting lost? Yes, they could be considered the same. So my proposal would be not to not to add this type of mechanism. At least if, it should it should make sure he's able to detect it's a lost message. It's the last um, key material. It can do that by checking the key material version number. So yes. That can be done. Um, yeah, I think that works. So we will not add um, such a mechanism. Uh, next slide. So this is a very old email from Jim. 
uh, when does the KDC need to roll the keys over? Um, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, skip the first part of the email. The one case that I have not been able to get a good handle on is as follows. The KDC persists keys and key IDs in a database. The KDC at some point crashes and then restarts. Should the KDC roll the epoch and the key material on restart or should it just load the current key material and continue with it? A client that tries to join would be unable to do so. I guess you meant, Jim, while the KDC is, is uh, offline because the KDC does not respond, so that would not force a rollover. A client that tries to do a renewal because of IV exhaustion would be unable to do so and would have to go quiet until the KDC uh, restarts, I guess, because uh, becomes alive and that would not force a rollover. A client that tries to do a leave would not be able to tell the KDC that. This is the one case that having the KDC do the rollover of the keys would make sense. However, the KDC would be unable to tell anybody of that decision as all of the observed relationships would have been lost at the point. So that in some respects, the damage of allowing an entity that left to continue reading messages would continue. Um, yes. And we don't have any type of considerations about that, about the KDC, um, KDC crashing and restarting. And so this might be something that we want to add. Um, I don't know exactly what we want, like what we can mandate and what just needs to be a security consideration at that point. I think I would be happy with that. With security considerations or, yeah. okay. So we don't mandate any type of, uh, if the KDC crashes and restarts, then it must um, do a key rollover. I think the security considerations may recommend it, but not mandate. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Because you're also like assuming here in this mail that um, the key rollover is done with observe and that might not be the case. That is not the only way that we uh, we define like um, uh, exchanges with the KDC. So it might not be possible, but also it might be possible. So, yeah. Okay. So we will give it a shot and we'll try to write some text. Next slide. Congestion controls control needs to be included. Um, so uh, I am not sure what we need to do here in our document. Uh, so so you're you're saying that um, part of this can be a reference to section four point five point one of 7641, where we're using observe, but we need to go through the document, document and potentially look at some other places where we need to discuss congestion as well. Um, yeah, basically the observe mandates that you do not send out an observe notification more than once a second, more than once, one per second. So. If you roll the keys over faster than that, then you start having a problem that the observe documents say that you don't send out notifications. So people will not get those those key rollover events. Mm -hmm. Assuming that you use observe to do key rollover. Right. But even even if you don't, if if as long as you are sending messages yes, out of that, any time. Right, that makes sense. Then, then you need to talk about a congestion problem. So okay. Jim, just to be clear, the congestion problem here is not necessarily that you yourself are at risk of causing congestion on the network, but rather that the pre-existing limits in transmission rate could cause issues for you 
in certain use cases. Is that correct? I think that's probably true. I don't know that the KDC would actually cause congestion itself because it does have to get events coming into it in order to, to do the key rollover. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was understanding correctly because when I see congestion control needs to be included, uh, I start wondering if we should be asking for a, a TSVR early review. But Yeah, well, I kind of wondered that myself. <laughs> I, I believe you have the power to push the button and <laughs> ask for it. I don't know that I want to explain the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, where, where does the one second thing come from that you just mentioned? It comes from RFC 7641. I think it's at most one every three seconds, even. As <laughs> it three seconds? I thought it was only one second. I think three. It should not more than one per RTT, if you don't have RTT, use three seconds as your RTT estimate. Uh, then there's also a must strictly limit the number of simultaneous outstanding notification responses to a given client to end start. Uh, and I guess end start is one by default. Yeah, so are, are we assuming that we are using non-confirmable messages here because Otherwise, you have something like an RTT estimate. I have to run to my next meeting in one minute, so maybe we should take this offline. I, I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, most of them, I think, are would be non-confirmable, but some of them are going to be confirmable because that's the way Observe works. Okay, but for this document, what I'm getting is that we need to add some considerations. Um, I will have to think about where this goes in the draft. Yeah, it makes sense to have a consideration about congestion control. Um, okay, I think I think we have to stop here anyway for today. But there was only one more point left that has not had a conclusion. Next oh, slide. Got it. See what it is. Yeah, it's the keeping the same key identifier for groups. There was for this mail. There was some discussion, um, but we never actually ended up with uh, an action point. I don't know if, if if you meant that we want to add also some consideration here or I thought we added that. We basically are saying try and keep the same. I think this text yes, in is, is, is keep the yes. Same. Is that enough or is that more I think that's enough. I think okay, that's enough. That's great. That's good. Okay, but then next slide is the plan forward, which is basically um answer these points and submit the next version. And then we are done with the to-dos. Um, when do you plan to submit the next version or is that? As, yeah, no, as soon as we have this text, this text in, I don't okay. know. <laughs> okay, no, no, but that's, um, I, I will review, the, so I can review the, the current version. Yes. It's not a major thing, okay. Yes, yes. Good. Thank you. Okay, so I think we can we we will close the meeting. Um, I just want to let you know that we do have a another interim meeting planned. If I can find the, the slide, so it's um, next month. Um, yeah. So see you next month. I hope we could discuss the next versions of each of those drafts next month and maybe 
um, having some of those uh, sent to the IEG. So maybe, Jim, do you want to say something before we close? Uh, no, I'm fine. OK. So well, thank you, everyone, for attending that meeting. And see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.